united effort. And there are some Washington, D.C.-based groups that are, you know, that is what they're pushing for, and that is all that they believe is possible. And opportunities to amend the Constitution and build movements like I think we have an opportunity to do right now do not come very often. And like I said, we don't have that much time. So I don't want to see us amend the Constitution to undo Citizens United and then realize, oh, you know, now we got to do it again and expect the public to understand or to be down for that fight, right? So let's use this opportunity to do the real thing. And part of our work actually needs to be to push on some of those more liberal organizations to recognize that this is the moment. We can actually do this. Let's have faith in the public and the people and build a movement and not just kind of be happy with crumbs. Yeah. <laughs> Kirky and being with us tonight and sharing all this is, is really exciting. I'm, I'm doing as best I can. Okay, I'll just the question. <laughs> okay. Uh, my question was um, the, the relationship of, I think Citizens United, if I'm right, and you can correct me on this, is that it treats uh, labor and corporations as equals in terms of what right. its goals are. And I heard you say a little bit before at the beginning, and it skipped me, about the relationship with labor and how to approach it. And I just wondered how you approach labor organizations, because they're not the same thing as corporations but that Citizens United treats them the same way. Right. And then how do you pull that back together in terms of uh, building this coalition and how we go forward? Sure. Thank so you. the question was about labor unions and how, um, how do we work with them given the fact that Citizens United actually ruled that they're the same for the purpose of contributing money to politics. Well, a couple things. Um, one, uh, the court has actually not really ruled that corporations and unions are the same. They did in for the purposes of spending money in independent expenditures in Citizens United. But you could have a whole timeline of how unions have been denied personhood rights when they had tried for them when corporations have been granted them. So there's actually a history already of there being a double standard, if you will, for unions. And a lot of folks in organized labor know that. Um, and originally, a lot of labor unions were in support of Citizens United. The AFL-CIO, which is not a particularly radical, uh, you know, organized institution w wrote an amicus brief in support of Citizens United in that case. But since then they have come out against it. And the reason why is because they recognize that they can't compete. Um, on the law, maybe they have a right to, but they do not have the money that corporations have. And a lot of rank and file people in organized labor actually recognize that if unions were spending their money on organizing more people to be members of unions, that would be a more effective use of their funds than trying to compete with the Koch brothers or you know what have you. So I think you're, we're seeing a shift in labor. Uh, we just found out that the Longshoremen Union um, has a resolution calling for an end to corporate personhood. And at the end of the day, our amendment does apply to unions as well because they are an artificial entity if they're like recognized under the law, like a corporation. And th that's a political question that we need to decide after this amendment passes what role different entities will have in the political process. For-profit corporations, non-profit corporations, unions, PACs, you know, that's a political question and we can pretend like it isn't and it's up to the court, but it's still a political question. They're just the ones deciding it for us instead. And so we need to, we need to figure that out. And I, you know, there is a little bit of fear, I think initially on the part of some unions, especially the larger ones, but I'm happy to say that next month we'll be at the National SEIU uh, convention as a guest speaker to give four different workshops on how to work with them. And one of the members of our national team is a uh, vice president in Workers United, which is currently merging with SEIU. So we're seeing a lot of traction with organized labor that we didn't see in the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, when the Citizens United uh, resolution passed the New Mexico legislature, there was a, a large uh, minority who voted in opposition to that resolution. Would it be useful to use that, to use their vote in a campaign, political campaign against those individuals? I think so. I think absolutely. I think that this needs to, we need to do the work to make this a litmus test issue for when people are running for office. And not just at the federal level, at the state level too, and, and maybe even also at the local level. But certainly, you know, we need state and federal because that's how you pass an amendment. And so, you know, drawing attention to the fact that their constituents, I mean, on the whole, Republicans in office vote against 
uh, our resolutions, but Republicans who are just registered voters as Republicans vote for our resolutions when we do them through the citizens' initiative process. So we need to show that dif difference of the leadership from the rank and file and create a wedge within the conservative community because most conservatives are actually with us on this. Um, in some ways, this might look like an elitist liberal cause. And when you're speaking to the average person, what are the most common resistances or apathy that you might f face, and how do you meet with that? And I'm also anticipating corporations are powerful not only with money and convincing people to vote against their own interests. Uh, what's the strategy there at the at the well, lower personal level. Yeah, there's no question that even though we're not seeing organized resistance on the part of large corporations yet, we will, and we're not naive about that. Um, you know, honestly, most folks, I feel like their response is that they don't feel like there's anything we can do about it. It's not that they disagree or think that, um, you know, that, that we should do this, but that they don't see this as being possible because the system is so corrupt, Congress is so corrupt. So I think that what's needed in this moment, and it doesn't have to be moved to amend, no matter what we are doing, we need to create experiences where people actually get to experience their power and recognize their power and to be filled with that feeling. And I got involved um, in the moment, in the kind of height of the global justice movement in this country, right? When like we were able to shut down the WTO meetings in Seattle in 1999 and the IMF World Bank meetings in Washington, D.C. And, you know, that caused me to drop out of school. I did go back, but, and, 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 um, and do this work because sitting in a classroom just couldn't compare anymore with the idea of bringing together, you know, tens of thousands of people to shut down the most powerful people in the world in being able to meet their agenda. And, and, and there's nothing like it. And I think that we need to create, and it doesn't have to be that monumental, right? That, that tactic, I think, is over. We can't do that again. We need to think of something new. But those experiences are what turn people and make people uh, be willing to set aside, you know, whatever it is, TV, life, um, you know, other distractions and feel like they belong and that they want to be part of it. So I think that's the biggest issue. I haven't, I haven't hardly met anyone who disagrees with us. It's more, we can't do this, this can't be done. So that's the argument that we have to counter and we have to illustrate and show for people that all, at the end of the day, we have the power. And I look to the history, but if that doesn't, you know, if that doesn't resonate with you, if that's not exciting to you, then let's make it happen in the present where we exercise our power collectively, and it's infectious when we do that. I have read your amendments, and they sound very desirable. However, what I'd like to hear you address a little bit is moves to amend's concrete strategy for getting it adopted. And like, I let, so the things I'd like to hear you talk about is I know you're trying to get resolutions by local bodies of government. Uh, and I'd like to know concrete examples of where this has been successful. One, I know, I understand one was adduced in Albuquerque in 2012. And I'm wondering what the status of that is. And I'm also sort of wondering what kind of organization Move to Amend has on the ground here in New Mexico? Well, um, thanks for that question. So our, our main strategy has been um, these local resolutions, or I would say it's a tactic. Um, and there are over 500 now that have passed in communities across the country. Our preferred way of getting these resolutions passed is through the citizens' initiative process because there's nothing like taking it to the public directly and giving them the chance to debate and decide on this. Unfortunately, in this state, the citizens' initiative process is not available to you. But you still can build a resolution campaign through a city council that does a lot of the same benefits of what a citizens' initiative does. So what we 
don't think works is just, you know, having some allies on the city council going to them saying, which honestly, I'm going to be real blunt, this is what happened in Santa Fe. Some folks, new folks in, in the city council in Santa Fe, progressive, got it done. Almost nobody in Santa Fe knows that a resolution happens. They weren't involved in that effort. And so as folks are looking at Albuquerque again, and initially the resolution was defeated by the city council, I think what's really key is are you involving the public in that fight? Are you using this as an opportunity to educate, to organize? Thank you. And um, because we don't have those skills right now. We're really not, we're not a very powerful people collectively. Um, and so that's what we need to use these opportunities to do. The, the resolutions themselves don't mean anything if they don't represent, you know, tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of people who are organized behind them, right? Otherwise, they're just a list on a paper of places that say, this is what we want, you know? And so that was never our intention with the tactic. And, and to be totally honest, move to amend folks have been going real, really fast. And not that we don't want to get this done quickly, but at the same time, we can't short circuit the organizing. We can't shortcut the movement building and think that this is going to get done. So in a lot of places that have passed resolutions through just going to the city council and talking to some friends, um, they're actually having to go back and recognize that they're, they need to come up with other tactics. And so we have a listening project that we are engaged with right now. And I would encourage the Albuquerque group to consider being part of that. And that's a survey instrument that you go door knocking with uh, to talk to people and to become more um, proficient at being able to uh, respond to people's questions and hearing from them what it is that they think is important. Um, we also have this campaign pledge to amend, which is to work with state legislators. But again, it's to like not just go to the state legislators, but to get a whole list of organizational endorsements, which means going to local organizations, finding out what they're working on and making the concrete connections um, to what this amendment would do to help their work. And, um, and then going to your state legislature and asking them to pledge to support the amendment when it comes through Congress and potentially to uh, support an act like we have in Minnesota and some other states are looking at. So um, for us, it's not so much about like a timeline. It's about um, stages of power and the way that you pass an amendment is you have to have uh, two thirds of the states and then you have to get the states to ratify it. So really it's about that. And you know, it's not just the legislatures because they're gonna be happy to step aside and step out of the limelight every step of the way, even the ones who we think are on our side. So we need to make sure that we again have tens of hundreds of thousands of people who are organized and who are willing to say, I'm not voting for anyone who doesn't support this amendment for example. So, um, so that's the work. We don't have the 10 point plan. We have a direction that we know that we need to go in and we have a method which is community organizing and movement building. And No, we, we don't. I wish that we, you know, had state coordinators that were staffed. We have volunteer organization here in central New Mexico. There's a volunteer organization in Taos. Um, I hope that through this tour, both of those two groups will have some new energy. Um, and then we also, I hope, will come out with a Las Cruces and Santa Fe group as well. And uh, our national office is in California. And um, most of the folks who work on the national level are volunteers as well. There's only a few of us who are paid staff. And we're doing this because we care, not really so much as a career. And um, we do need to get to the point, though, where we can have that kind of staffing um, because we need folks who can do this every day, not just on the side. But right now, it's really a volunteer-led effort. So um, Tom is your local contact. Do you want to wave again here in Albuquerque? And if folks are interested in getting involved, uh, talk to Tom. There's some other folks here um, from the group as well. And your meetings are when? Uh, 11 a.m. the third Saturday of every month at the Peace and Justice Center if you're here in Albuquerque or Bernalillo County. So I see there are some other folks behind you, and I also wanted to give Moji the chance to speak as well. Yes. Um, you're depending on a constitutional convention as a fallback position. Uh, I'm hesitant to embrace that. Uh, for one, um, my understanding is 
constitutional conventions would be open. It wouldn't just deal, wouldn't necessarily just deal with one item. And there are a lot of um, right-wing um, nuts out there that have all kinds of ideas of changing our Constitution. So that makes me hesitate. Uh, and then the other thing is I'm not sure exactly how delegates to a constitutional convention are chosen. Maybe you can enlighten me. Well, the delegates are chosen by state <coughs> legislatures. And, uh, and then the exact process to do that is not spelled out in the Constitution. So that's up to each state. And in terms of your point about the risks of a convention and moving backwards um, by uh, the you know extreme right potentially being able to use that opportunity to push, you know, yeah, as a woman, I feel ya on terms of <laughs> what that might look like, right? But actually, it is not spelled out in the Constitution one way or the other whether you can have a single purpose convention or not. And I would submit to you that that is, again, it's a question of political power. Do we have the political power to ensure that that's all that gets discussed? Well, then, yes, we can have a convention that's on amending it to pass the We the People Amendment, for example. And that is why it is so critical that we look at this as movement building, and you know, not about passing a policy, and, and that'll be the ultimate decider. And we wouldn't want to start to call for that convention and see it through until we had those numbers. Because you're absolutely right. You know, we don't. It's not that needs to be. If it, if it's going to be anything beyond passing this amendment, then that needs to be about actually social justice and human rights, not moving backwards at all. And we have those same same um, concerns. But constitutional scholars will tell you it's not clear, and so there is a lot of concern. But I think it's about how much political power we have to, to tightly say, this is what it is, and we will enforce that through our power. And, um, and anybody that tries to usurp the process, will, that would not be possible because that would not be what the agenda is and why it happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, not really, you have to speak up. Oh. Uh, I just wanted to apologize for being late. I just got in from Seattle where it's warm and sunny. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> to, to I know, I brought all the rain with me. I live in Northern California. To drizzly and cold. <laughs> but I just... I, <laughs> so and, and you may have covered this, but I'm just curious, a show of hands, of how many people here have contacted someone, state legislature, person, U.S. legislature, city council, county council, how many people have actually contacted someone? About this issue. About the county level or the municipal level? Does any level. Any level? Yeah. Any level. Just to put a point on what she's saying. That's about <laughs> one quarter? Okay, well that's what has to change. The way, if you won't care about this, what has to change is every single hand here needs to go up. I think that's what she's saying. If every hand doesn't go up eventually, it ain't gonna happen. So every one of you has to decide you're gonna do something about it. I'm in Occupy Las Lunas, about a half hour south of here, and we've petered out to three people, but I hold a sign every Sunday for the last two years now. Well, haven't held the sign for two years, but we've been out there every Sunday for the last two years, uh, except for like one day when our schedules collided holding signs to just educate people and get honks and some middle fingers. And I've got a sign that says, move to amend.org. People drive by, sometimes people drive up and, and give us a piece of their mind. And some of them, a Fox News viewer, one was almost ready literally to start a fist fight because he was watching Fox News. And then we told him what it was really about. And he said, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's very interesting. So we produced a handout for Fox News viewers, which you're welcome to. <laughs> which it, I've only got <laughs> some of it. No, no, no. So if anybody wants to take a look at this, it's also on the web, and we strongly support this. And again, if you want this, every single hand here needs to go up. That's And I've contacted, uh, I'm working with the Valencia County Commissioners, it failed once, and I expect it to pass a second time. I'm working with our Peralta Town Council where I live. I'm hoping to get him passed. He's refusing to call me back. I may have to sit in his office. 
As soon as people discover <coughs> that you're not going to go away if they ignore you, then they'll start talking to you. I did that with Senator, State Senator Clemente Sanchez. I've been trying to get a meeting with him for six months. Finally had one two days ago when he finally decided that ignoring me wasn't going to work. So that's what you got to do. And he actually is very supportive of this. He won't commit to anything until he reads something in writing, but he, he says that he's very supportive of this. So it takes every one of us to talk to our representatives, senators, city councils, town councils, counties, if you want this to happen. Thank you. If Thank your hands you. stay down, it ain't going to happen. And let me, let me just add that I think the I don't disagree, and I thank you for all that you said, and I think that the extra piece would be to not just do it as individuals, you know, with your call or your letter, but to actually go in in mass. I mean, if you even just have 10 people who show up in a state senator's office, that's a big deal, right? Especially if you're not willing to leave until they listen to you. So, um, you know, it, it, part of the problem is that we're always encouraged to do this individual action, this individual action, and then our, our Congress people or whoever are supposed to connect the dots about how many of us there are. Well, why leave it up to them to pill in the piece, pill it in, right? Let's just go in in big numbers like what if all of us went down to City Hall I think the Albuquerque City Council might think wow you know maybe we made a mistake with the way that we voted on that resolution last time oh thank you yay swearing in last January Three of us from Occupy Las Lunas were there. We stamped $50 of $1 bills with this stamp and handed them out to people as they went in. <laughs> it only cost us 50 bucks, and we got, you know, some press about it. So before we go to the next question, I see there's two folks, and I do want to open it up to Moji. But I, I would be three. No, I'll pick stuff. Oh, um, well, I, we could, I could keep going with whoever wants to stay, but I do need to do my due diligence and job. Um, so this event was free, and as I told you, uh, Move to Amend is basically powered by volunteer labor, and uh, our website does look pretty fancy, but that was all volunteer labor, and um, so sometimes people get the impression, they think that they're calling like, you know, some giant Washington, D.C. office. Well, the office of Move to Amend is in the downstairs of my house, and there are five people working very hard out of that office full time, um, but nonetheless, you know, that is, that is how we're doing this. We kind of like the way uh, labor organizers had to organize but when, when uh, it was a conspiracy to organize a labor union. So if everyone could even just pull out a few dollars, I have can here, and I am going to pass it because we uh, we don't ask the local groups to put put in any money to bring us as speakers, and so my plane ticket and the gas and the and the car and all that need to be funded from this bucket. So. Yes, sir. History lesson that you gave us before, I. Pleasure. At the very beginning of your talk, a lot of people who have who are very educated, have had lots of schooling, would be very surprised to understand some of the things that you talked about, um, and don't always realize that there's a different kind of history mm -hmm. um, in our country, mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of propaganda, there's a lot of brainwashing. Yeah, I didn't and, learn any of this in college or high school or anything. Like and. <laughs> People have very strong identifications to corporations. Mm -hmm. They grow our food, even though it's really people who grow our food and the earth that gives us that food. People associate corporations with good things right. in their lives. Right. Um, what kind of education strategies do you have to, re to change people's education, to um, brought in their understanding of what the Constitution is, what their history is, what the history of these struggle movements are, how these movements um, evolve, how they repeat themselves over again. Um, so what is your education strategy? Well, one thing I would say is that, um, I, you know, like I said, I didn't learn any of this in college or high school. I'm not a lawyer. And uh, I think any of you, thank you, <laughs> We do have some
some lawyers who work with us, but those of us who aren't are always making sure that they're the last ones to get the weigh-in. Um, so I think any of you are actually perfectly capable of telling this story. And that tool right there of the timeline is a wonderful tool to use. Your notes are like right there. And that's available through our website at cost. You can buy that version and even a larger version if you want. Um, so that's one thing. We also do hold uh, like political education events around the country. And we'll be in Austin next month if folks want to join us for our grassroots democracy convergence in Austin. Uh, would love to invite you out to that. And then um, I think that one of the things that we do need to do is really partner with high school teachers because civics is not taught anymore. And uh, we do, there are a lot of uh, high school and college professors whose classrooms we've spoken in. Um, but, you know, there's only a few of us at the national level and it doesn't, it's not efficient for the earth for us to be the ones to do all of this. So what we really need is like the populist movement had, you know, thousands of speakers who actually could just go to their neighboring town and give a stump speech and story about what the populists were doing. And that's what we need to all collectively be able to do. So one of the things that local local affiliates um, have done is set up their own trainings where they, uh, they practice um, this, you know, teaching this information and then making themselves available to community groups or colleges or high schools. So I, I hope that, you know, with this influx of people that I know the Albuquerque group is going to get, that some of you who are educators step up and help uh, make it so that more people who weren't in the room tonight get to hear the stories. influence her voice in any of these decisions? Um, the National Chamber of Commerce is very much, you know, on the side of expanding corporate constitutional rights. I would say that, you know, the Chamber of Commerce is actually a very brilliant institution that was created to dupe local business into thinking that they're, that what's good for Wall Street is good for them. And one of the things we need to do is actually reach, you know, local business and get them to stand up and give them um, backing to stand up to say, you know, hey, I don't get to exercise any of these rights as a company. And we do, you know, have some folks on our national team who are business owners. And, you know, here in New Mexico, you all have um, awesome independent business alliances. I think those would be great gro groups to work, reach out to. So it really isn't so often the local chambers, but the national chamber is pushing a message from up down um, that, you know, corporate rights, that when, if we're, you know, trying to undo corporate personhood, that that's attacking local business. And that's one of the things that we need to build relationships with local businesses so that they know that, that you know, we're not coming for them. And in fact, uh, if corp large corporations were not exercising constitutional rights, that would actually make it so that we could pass laws to protect our local businesses and our local economies. And that's part of what we would do. Questions. Sure. I don't know what this gentleman meant about putting a stamp on the dollar. Yeah, so at the back, actually, there's my mom. We have these stamps that say, corporation is not a person. Money is not free speech. And this is a project that uh, we partnered with Ben Cohen of Ben & Jerry's. It was his idea, and he wanted us to, to do it. So you can actually stamp your dollar bills with Thank this you. message. Um, and then that is a way that even if not <coughs> to just get it out there. And we have heard stories of people coming back to us because they found the bills or organizers, you know, getting their bills back. And um, it's a little bit edgy. It's not legal. It's not illegal. It's also not, you know, explicitly legal. But um, we are not, the, what the law says is you cannot deface or mutilate currency for the purpose of, of taking it out of circulation. So obviously that is not our purpose. And Ben Cohen has actually been on a lot of, you know, corporate big media stamping his bills and he hasn't had any trouble yet. So I don't think anyone in this audience, if you stamped your bills, would have trouble. So that is a great, just small way to get the message out. Yeah, the stamps on online, they're $12. If you buy them here tonight, they're 10 And uh, we have just the corporations are not people, money is not speech ones here tonight. But there are a couple other messages you could buy online as well, uh, not to be used for bribing politicians. And uh, the system isn't broken, it's fixed, are our other two stamps. Tool you keep referring to. So if to. you go to the Move to Amend website and you just type in the search bar timeline, Timeline. One that comes up. It's a corporate rights timeline or timeline of right, uh, personhood rights and powers is its full name. But just put in timeline and it'll be the first thing that pops up. Thank you. And last is a fantastical question, just a fantasy. 
Do you have a timeline for yourselves? Well, we've, we've been hesitant to put a timeline on, um, but we definitely feel as though we can't take longer than 10 years. So that's what we, what we have talked about. And as we kind of grow and organize, uh, we think, you know, at some point it will become clear what the timeline is. But right now what we're saying is we need to move in such a way that we could get this done in 10 years because the earth can't wait. From now, I would say, yeah. Right, yes, the timeline does depend on us. And that's why we haven't put a timeline on it is it's not happening tomorrow, let me tell you. But we do have over 300,000 people who have signed the petition, and that is with zero corporate media, right? So no mainstream uh, television media um, of any kind. We actually haven't ever even been on Democracy Now!, so if you want to contact Amy Goodman and let her know that she should cover this, that would be great. Um, but that's 300,000 people who through word of mouth and through you know local organizing have come to us. So before we close, I do just want to turn it over briefly because I think he has a really great example and I think there's a lot of synergy with our work and I'm excited that it happened to be that our paths crossed. Moji is from the Mositeg Leg Legacy Institute. Um, one of their honorary chairs is Noam Chomsky. He's an Iranian American and peace and human rights activist and he's on a national tour to promote circles of nonviolence. And we were talking before the event about his experience with uh, BP, which here in America now we know BP, right? Because they're the ones responsible for the Gulf, not spill. Spill is when I like, you know, drop my milk on the ground, a catastrophe. But um, in his country, you know, is kind of where BP's rise to power uh, really started in taking over a government. So he's going to speak to like a real concrete example of corporate rule in work, in action. Thank you. And I'm so proud of a young daughter of New Mexico. <laughs> Give her a hand. Um, my name is Moji Aga. I'm a Sufi monk and a peace and human rights and environmental activist. I founded the Mossadegh Legacy Institute, which one of its projects is precisely what we are talking about in circles of nonviolence, uh, which we had the 14th of it, uh, just two days ago when I spoke at the Peace and Justice Center celebrated uh, the purpose of these circles of nonviolence is to begin the process of integrating the results of what we as peace, justice, and environmental activists do toward having cumulative effect so that we can come out of the margins of the society and be able to actually create the critical mass that such a constitutional amendments and a constitutional convention is needed. I mean, uh, it, uh, for it to happen, it's needed. I want to talk very briefly, I don't have time, and uh, it's late in the hour. Um, Musaddegh Legacy Institute. Dr. Mohammad Musaddegh was Iran's democratically elected prime minister. Uh, he was called the Gandhi of Iran the George Washington of Iran, and it was, uh, and he was, his government, his pluralistic uh, democratic government was overthrown by the CIA at the behest of who? At the, be at the behest of a number of corporations, chief among them, the company that we now know as British Petroleum. And the British Petroleum and its seven sisters seven American sisters with huge powers, they manipulated the foreign policy of the United Kingdom and the United States toward overthrowing a government that had he, had the, had the government of the Gandhi of Iran been allowed to stand, we wouldn't have the disaster that we have witnessed in Syria today. Thank you. We would not have had 9-11, neither the 9-11 2001 
nor the 9-11 in Chile, when the Mossadegh of Ch Chile, uh, Salvador Allende, was overthrown in 1973 on September 11. The, the, the corrupting effect of these corporations, the VP and the seven sisters, American sisters mainly, the corrupting influence of what they did on the American uh, foreign policy and indirectly on the American Constitution. This American Constitution is supposed to belong to we the people, not we the sheeple. And, and, and we, as long as we do not, as in the, in the, way, in the words of Professor Noam Chomsky, who is the honorary chair of the Board of Endorsers of the Mossadegh Legacy Institute, he said, go organize the hood. Go organize the hood means break out of preaching to the choir of progressives and actually reach the people who are brainwashed by the, by the weapons of mass stupefaction, by propaganda. So we need to go, we need to have the critical mass to be able to show we the people who have given up, they are suffering, we are suffering from the symptoms of marginalization. We have given up, that's why when the gentleman asked how many people have, have uh, uh, you know, raised their hand if, if you have contacted your local representatives, the reason people don't do that is because we are marginalized, we are systematically marginalized, we don't have a movement that, that is integrated so that we can actually move policy, change policy. These policies are, are in our name. Foreign policy, economic policy, social policy, cultural policy, healthcare policy, we name it, you name it. We need to have the power in order to be able to influence those policies. Obviously, corporations through their hijacking of the U.S. Constitution and the Constitution of other countries, by the way. These corporations have been able to take away our powers, our we the people powers, and make us give up. Therefore, people out there, and there are powerful propaganda interests around the world, and in this country especially, to make people to give up so that corporations can make decisions on our behalf and by our representatives. So the movement uh, to build circles of nonviolence is to take back what, we, what belongs to us. Unfortunately, I don't have time. Please go to the website of the Mossadegh Legacy Institute and Mossadegh is spelled M-O-S-S-A-D-E-G-H, Mossadegh Legacy Institute, go to the project called America for Nonviolence. Thank you so much, and God bless the real people of the United States and the world. out if folks uh, signed the petition um, when you came in then you'll be on the move to amend list and that means our local group will also be able to let you know about local actions and activities I really do encourage folks to look at the we the people listen project that we are doing in pilot phase right now but hope to continue in 2014 as a way to organize the hood and work with uh, regular folks who are not the types of folks who would come to a lecture like this and um, Pick up a stamp if you want to get one. If you want one of the other ones, you can go to movetoamend.org to find all the resources. And I, I want to thank the, this Unitarian Church for putting us on tonight. They didn't charge us, and it was very gracious of them, so thank you very much.
And also, just thank you to Tom and the Albuquerque group. They've been working kind of an uphill battle in a lot of ways. And uh, I hope that you all will plug in with them and get involved because uh, New Mexico could be a very exciting state where we could be doing this work. But honestly, right now, we are not as well organized as we need to be. So I hope that you are inspired to actually, you know, not just come to a talk, but to actually roll up our sleeves and get to work because we can do this and we will do this. And I look forward to working with you on it. Oh, there's one more. I'm sorry. I want to volunteer the Raging Grannies to sing a song. Yes. Yeah, we'd love that. So Are there other Raging Grannies I don't here think there are any other Raging Grannies here tonight, but I can sing it by myself. Okay, do you want to go do it in the mic that where everyone can actually hear you? <laughs> raging Granny music. Corporations are not people, they're a legal fiction. But the Supreme said they are, oh, what a contradiction. Corporations are not men, they don't have erections. But the court gave them the right to control our elections. <laughs> Corporations do not eat but they use lots of water. Our economy they grabbed and took it to the slaughter. Corporations are not women, never nursed a baby, but their, their bribes have rigged the game so they get all the gravy. 